Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Father, we thank you for your, your mercy and your, your desire, Father, to reveal yourself to us, to make yourself known to us so we can experience you and your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, I pray you will draw us to you this morning. I pray you will open our eyes to you and what you're doing in Isaiah 40 and following to communicate to us your desire to save us and bring us to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We find in the text we're going to read today, 43.22 through 44.20, almost the same outline and message of what we did last week in 42.18 through 43.21, which is why it's titled The Witness Part 1 and The Witness Part 2, because it's the similarity is there, and the message pretty much is the same. Well, we have to stop and think about this. Why? What is God's purpose? What is he doing? Um, he calls on witnesses for him and what he's doing with his people. And then he calls on witnesses of the world to bring witness of what their gods are doing for them and how they're working in their lives and in the world. And, of course, God's people can bear witness of what God is doing, even in our rebellion against him, rejection of him as his people. He's working in our lives, and we can bear witness of that fact we get our act together, repent, and come back to him. Of course, the people of the world have nothing they can bear witness of that their gods have done. Um, they serve these gods, and they sacrifice for these gods, but these gods can't produce nothing for them. They can't explain the present, nor can they explain the past, nor can they foretell the future, all of which God can do. So the emphasis last week was Israel's failure God's redemption, and through all that process, they are witnesses of God's work to the lost world, of God's love for them, even in their failure, and God's restoring them. The passage this morning is, again, Israel's failure and God's redemption and the absolute failure of false gods. So he, he magnifies the false god failure in this second part. But again, it's repetition, and God does that for a reason. Uh, through repeating, we learn, we remember. It also is used for emphasis. So God is emphasizing the message here these past two weeks concerning you are my witnesses. The emphasis is to God's people, you are my witnesses. We are God's people as a church, therefore the text speaks to us, and God is emphasizing to us, you are my witness. And that witness is his work in my life. So again, God calls for witness, chapter 44, verses 8 and 9. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know so that they will be put to shame. Again, calls for witnesses. In verse 8, he identifies himself. He identifies his witnesses. He says, do not be afraid. He's communicating his love to his people in the redemptive process. He says, I have not long, have I not long since announced? And from the beginning of God's call to Abraham, God has revealed his plan to save the world of their sins. Since the call of Abraham, God has revealed that he will make that Savior present. He will reveal that Savior through Abraham and his descendants. Uh, everything in the Bible is predestination. It's talking about God predestined. Who would bear the witness of him? It never refers to salvation. It always refers to the person, the individuals, the organization, now the church, who will bear witness of God's salvation through Jesus. So that is what he just said. Have I not from long ago revealed to you, you are my witnesses, that I am your Savior, and I am the Savior of the world. God calls them to be his witnesses, as he's called the church now to be his witnesses. And I like how God asks, is there any other God besides me? And, and he's asking his people that. Do you know of any other God besides God? He's asking you that. You're reading the verse. 
And, and in all honesty, we start thinking about that question. Well, absolutely not. I mean, the idols aren't gods. We figured that out. Ideology is not a god because they change with opinions. So, no, there is no other god. Verse 9. God calls for witnesses of those who serve the false gods. They fail to see, he says. The idols produce nothing. They fail to see the idols produce nothing. They fail to see there's no profit from the false gods. Uh, they fail to know. Their blindness leads to ignorance. Uh, they close their heart. They close their mind because their God and their mind is that idol, and they will not accept any other truth. So they are blind to the truth. They're blind to the reality that their God is not a God and is useless, is futile to serve or seek or create. An emphasis there on it's futile to create your own God because it profits you nothing. So they are literally in blindness and they are deceived, but they deceive themselves with their false gods. God then, in verse 8, says, you are my witnesses. Who is he referring to in verse 8 when he says, you are my witnesses? And just last, last week, we'll go back to the previous chapter and pick up at the beginning of the discussion. Now, chapter 43, beginning in verse 22. Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought to me the sheep of your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have bought me not sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with fat, the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. If you go back to chapter 42, beginning in verse 18, Hear you deaf, and look you blind, and you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or so deaf as my messenger, whom I send? Who is so blind as he is at peace with me, or so blind as the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but you do not observe them. And he goes on to list the failure of Israel. So both passages, 42, 18 and following, 43, 22 and following, is, a, is the repeat of the same outline and same formula. It begins with Israel's failure. But these are God's witnesses. Those who are the failure for God are the witnesses for God. God's people are never called to be perfect nor expected to be perfect. Even in my failure as a believer, I can bear witness of God through my confession, through my humbly acknowledging my failure, through my seeking God's forgiveness, through my rejoicing in God's forgiveness. All those things should be displayed around us. They were for Israel, whether they wanted to or not, because God came in and picked them up and exiled them to Babylon. The whole world saw their failure and God's discipline and punishment on them. But all of that, they were through all that, they were still being a witness for God. Verse 22, Israel has turned their backs on God. They have become weary of God. They have turned God into a religion of laws and have forgotten the relationship. And a religion with no relationship is just a religion. And God says, you weary me with your religion. You weary me with your duty and your routine that has nothing to do with your love for me or knowing me or walking with me. Verse 23, 24. Israel ceased to worship in any form. There are no burnt offerings or sacrifices. No offering of any kind. God does not long for this meaningless worship. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. They have abandoned God, and He has, but he has not left them. Uh, he acknowledges their sin and their sins before them, which is an interesting statement on God's part. You've disrespected me, rejected me, and you bring before me your sins with no submission or seeking repentance, just laying your sins outside of offerings. God says, I'm wearied with this, but he's still there, and he still intends to save. Picking up in verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us agree our case together. State your cause that you may be proved right. Your first forefather sinned, and your spokesmen have transgressed against me. So I will pollute the princes of the sanctuary, and I will consign Jacob to the man and Israel to revilement. 
God wants to engage them in conversation because God wants to lead them through conversation to realize their mistake, their failure, their sin, their rejection of him. If to sit down and talk with God, if I'm living in sin, I don't sit there very long before he makes it pretty clear where I stand. Not necessarily condemning or convicting even, but lovingly God brings to mind, look, this is failure. And I am here to talk with you and walk with you and lead you out of this. So he calls them out. Of course, when they are called out, their response is they don't respond well at all. But God comes to restore. God comes to redeem. He comes to save. He comes to remove their sins, which he says very plainly in verse 25. I'm the one who wipes out your transgression. Of course, he does all this for his sake, for his glory, for his honor, but also to save them. But God's desire is displayed here. His desire is to save the people, to bring them back into relationship with them. Verse 27, 28, from the beginning you have sinned. Well, Abraham wasn't perfect, was he? He sinned. He lied to people around him. He was fearful, didn't trust God. Abraham wasn't perfect. Israel's history is one of rejecting God. Actually, it's a royal pressure. It's We're high serving God and we're low rejecting God. And it's just up and down, up and down throughout their history which demonstrates they're not perfect, they are human, and they need God's intervention on a regular basis. And it closes by saying, your leaders, your princes, your, those who speak for me in the sanctuary, the temple, they have all failed. And God says he'll bring judgment on them for their sin. So, those who are to bear witness of God are these total failures. They're defined in 42, 18 and following, and 43, 22 and following. Both last week and this week, the text concerning the witnesses of God are referring to Israel, his servant, who had failed to be the proper witness for God. But even in their failure, they are still bearing witness of God. Of course, that can be a fearful thing. I don't want to be disgracing God through my sin. But in reality, because I am God's, as a believer, when I do sin, I still bear witness of God. It may be a negative witness, but I am bearing witness of God. And hopefully I am convicted and I respond to that conviction and I repent. And then right back, my repentance and his forgiveness is an even bigger witness for God. So he can use my failure for his glory when repentance takes place. God redeems his witnesses. Same as last week, beginning chapter 44, verse 1 through 8, God redeems his witnesses. 1 and 2. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord, who has made you and formed you from the womb. Who will help you? Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Uh, God has chosen his witnesses. God chose Abraham way back in the day, and God chose to his descendants that they would be his witnesses. God predestined they would bear the torch, if you will, they would bear the message, they would bear the absolute fact, truth, that God is God, there is no other, and God will provide a Savior for all of humanity to remove their sin and bring humanity into his presence. It says God formed them in the womb. He knew them from conception. God purposefully set them aside to be his people, to be his witness to the whole world. And church, that applies to us as the church. We are God's people. As the church, God has set us aside. He has pulled us aside as believers to be his witness, to be the sanctified ones who represent him, speak for him, and share his knowledge, our knowledge of him, to the world around us. That word Jeshurun in verse 2 is a name for Israel, often used when Israel's in rebellion against God. In fact, it's used, the other place it's used in the Old Testament is Deuteronomy. And both times is in, in the context of their failure. So, for one, there it's referred to them in their failure here, but also it points us back to Deuteronomy. It says they will fail in the long run. Verses 3 through 8. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's, and that one will call on the Lord's, on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name with honor. 
Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it, yet let him recount it to me in order. From the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming, and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you, and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me, or is there any other rock I know of none? God provides for Israel in verses 3, 4, and 5. He puts water on dry ground. He causes things to grow. It's his provision. It is God taking care of his children and providing for them when they're obedient and after their repentance and return to him. Um, and that's the picture. The word picture is being painted there. It talks about they will call on his name and, and claim his name and write his name on their hands, which again is a word picture of their absolute devotion and obedience to him and responding to him. Responding to his love. But God is Israel's Savior, and there is no other, verses 6 and 7. Um, notice in verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and the last. That's one of the first pictures of the separation of God the Father, God the Son. And Jesus calls himself, first himself as the first and the last. He refers back to this text, I believe. Acknowledging God the Father sends God the Son to be the Savior of the world. Again, there's so much in these passages. It is so very, very rich and very deep. The third item this morning, God defines the false gods and the failure of its witnesses. Chapter 44, verses 9 through 20. And this is one of the best descriptions of the futility of idol worship. And I'm going to read it and not explain it. In the coming week, you go back and read it. And you explain it because it's very self-explanatory how God lays it out. Those who fashion a graven image are all of them futile, and their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know, so that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame. For the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. The man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arm. He also gets hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man like the beauty of man, so that it may sit in a house. Surely he cuts cedars for himself, and takes a cypress or an oak, and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir, and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared over their eyes so they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot comprehend. No one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire, and also have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And again, there is no better description of the idols and what they represent and how man has deluded himself into believing the same piece of wood he burns to get himself warm. The other half he creates and calls it a god. Now, verse 20, he feeds on ashes, a deceived heart, has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, is there not a lie on my right hand? 
in verse 18, they do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared, smeared over their eyes so they cannot see in their hearts, so they cannot comprehend. And what that is communicating is not that God has closed their eyes so they can't see the truth. What it is saying is because they have fallen down to worship a stick as a God, that has closed their eyes. God will not allow a man to find any revelation of God in an idol. If he does, the idol has power. God will not honor that idol in any way whatsoever. And as long as the man falls down before the idol, he will never comprehend, understand, or see the living God. Because as long as that idol is present, he will give the idol credit for revelation and not God. So God makes sure, if you will, smear over his eyes where he cannot see the truth as long as he serves the idol. It's not a matter of God closes them out, pushes them out. It's a matter of God refusing to share his glory or allow any possibility for his glory to be given to a stick fashioned into an idol. So those who worship the idol are lost. And they do not see the truth because they worship a false god that they made. And think about it. The mind who makes an idol out of half the wood he burns to stay warm, what kind of mind is that? <laughs> They're not too bright. And of course, I'll probably to today's idols as well. The mind who takes the ideology and makes them their religion, what kind of mind is that? Well, today is very, very selfish and self-centered and or greedy. God repeats the message. Again, the same format as last week. The same idea. You are my witnesses. Although you're a failure today, I will redeem you and restore you. And you bear witness of me to the whole world. And those who worship false gods and false idols are futile, and they have no hope whatsoever. Back to back, the same outline, the same pattern. Why? Again, repetition helps us to remember. It is used for emphasis. It also helps to reveal. If you read these passages 50 times this week, you will get more out of it than reading it one time. So God is repeating himself to reveal more of himself as well. Not just so we remember it or to emphasize because if we read it more, we comprehend more. He reveals more. So if you go back again and read these passages from the beginning of 42, verse 18 and following, you will find some of the greatest one-liners in the Old Testament. Repetition is useful. It is a tool to reveal as much as possible as well. Again, note the pattern of last week and this week. You are God's witnesses, are lost and rebellion against God. God disciplines them to get them their attention and to redeem them. The people repent, and then God defines their lives after repentance, which is a blessed nation, a blessed people. He provides for them and takes care of them. The witnesses are be bearing witness of God. They are bearing witness of their life without God, how God got their attention, how they repented, and their life walking with God today. In Acts chapter 22, I think it is, Paul recounts his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. And it follows the same exact outline in Isaiah right here. My life before I knew God, how God got my attention, how I got saved, confession of faith, my life with God now. That same outline is in both last week's text and this week's text. You are my witnesses. He defines your life before they came to God. He defines how they got their attention. He defines their salvation experience. He defines their life with God, walking with God, and his protection and provision and glory upon them. You with me? These verses are emphasized to the church today. You are God's witnesses. And my question is, what is your witness? Is it written down in your notes? My life without God, how God got my attention, how I repent, my life walking with God. Is that in your notes? Look on page two. Look on page two. Yes, it is. I'm going to put that there somewhere. So this week, I want you to develop your witness based on that outline. The outline God gave us in Isaiah twice. He repeated himself to emphasize this is an effective way to bear witness of me. It's the same outline that Paul uses when he shares his testimony. Seriously. We are in end times. We're living in a chaotic world. Two generals in the last two weeks, they expect us to be a war in China by 2025. 
that's just chaotic. To come out and say that is crazy. We live in a crazy, chaotic, lost world. What is your testimony? What is your witness? Because we are not going to reach them on large scale. That has failed through entertainment and feel-good theology. We will only change this world in our community one person at a time. And that's you identifying one person and going to that person, developing a relationship with that person, and sharing your testimony with that person. It may take weeks, it may take months. But the point is, you will let God identify who in your life has he put there for you to bear witness of him to. And then go do it. And that really is becoming our focus as Cornerstone Church. I don't care if they come here and worship. <laughs> the important thing is, you are God's witness. Go bear witness. And direct them to some church. If here, great. Love to have it. But if not, point them to Jesus. That's the priority. Not pointing them to a church. Of course, maybe you need to point them away from some churches. But our priority is not pointing them to any church. Point them to Jesus and trust that God will then put them where he wants them to grow and serve. Again, I am amazed. When I read Isaiah last year, which led me to where we're doing it now, I read it twice back to back because I was so awed. Chapter 40 and following. There is so much here that God reveals through Isaiah. Equal to what he reveals in the New Testament. It is very, very rich in God's revelation to us. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will open our eyes to your truth in Isaiah. I pray, Father, you will give us a desire to pursue your truth in Isaiah. And to dig in deep. And to see what you were saying. Learn what you were saying. And ask you to reveal to us what you were saying. And Father, I pray also that we will be motivated by you to follow the outline given to us beginning in Isaiah 42 through 44, and that Paul followed Acts 22 to build our testimony, Father, so we can at ease, in any situation, communicate our witness to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.